week we're going to talk about how God loved them. And this is where we get hung up because we know that the world means everyone, but we have these questions. What about them? What about those people? Because I get that God loves us, but what about them? And I'm going to talk today about how we're going to cross the border of us and them. And we're going to talk about some things specifically that I know that I'm having conversations about behind the scenes. And I think what happens a lot of times is in church, we, we can preach messages or we can talk about things that are very global and big picture, but we never really discuss the exact thing. We never discuss maybe the specifics, but we're having the discussions around our dinner tables. And I think that the church is one of the first places that should provide a narrative of hope and of love. You guys with me today? We're going to start out in the book of John. And we're going to talk about how we're going to love our perceived opponent. Because when there's a them in life, they're our perceived opponent. And so in this scripture of John 3.16, God gives us this a great handbook with Jesus' life documented and Jesus is walking and Jesus' biggest opponent in culture is this group of men made up in Jewish culture called uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In the beginning of John chapter 3, there's this guy Nicodemus. Nicodemus is one of the Pharisees. I read this passage last week for us. And Nicodemus, I call him Nick because I would never say Nicodemus. Even if your name was Nicodemus, I would never call you that. That's a disorder that I have. I just give everyone nicknames. So Nick, you know, here's this guy, and he is the perceived opposite. He is the perceived opponent of Jesus. In culture, the Pharisees were the group of men, religious rulers of the time, that were legalistic. They thought by putting order and rules and re the religion and ritual around life, that that was keeping people perfect and getting them to heaven. And Jesus comes and inadvertently stands in opposition of that because he starts kind of saying these things like, yeah, it's not about all this stuff. It's actually about your heart and it's about, do you, do you believe in me as the son of God? And they didn't like that. Who do you think you are saying you're the son of God? And they end up being the faction that's behind getting one of Judas's best friends, uh, Jesus' best friends named Judas, who was a follower of Jesus. He was a disciple. It's a person that he sat and had his last meal with, and he looked and he knew Judas was one of them. And this is the story that even while Jesus knew he was one of them, he loved him. This is our takeaway today. This is when we see the story of Nicodemus, and Jesus is talking to good old Nick. He's saying to him, hey, I want you to understand that God sent me. In John 3, 16, the scripture says, God sent me, Jesus, his one and only son, so that whoever, whosoever, it says in the King James, whosoever believes in me and the Son of God would never perish but have eternal life. And there's this amazing scripture after in verse 17 that says, God didn't send his son Jesus to condemn the world. He didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn it, but he sent Jesus to save the world. So just as a foundation, I'm going to define some things today. And the first thing I'm going to define is this word, whosoever. We would say whoever in our modern language. In King James, it's whosoever. I like the word whosoever, that all of us are whosoever's because the word whosoever means individually, each, every, any, all, the whole. So it's not a fragmented piece. It's the whole. That's whosoever. Everyone, all things, everything, collectively. And this is the definition that I love that whosoever means sum of all types. And did you know that when you looked at the sum of all types, now I'm not talking about S-O-M-E sum, I'm talking about S-U-M, like the equation. If you looked at the sum of all types, you would find opposites in that sum. That in the equation of humanity, that we're born into diversity and we're born into differences that make us opposite. The most glaring example that I can tell you is I know that even in my life, um, the person or thing that is totally different from me, the reverse of some, someone or something else, that's what opposite means, that the person that best describes that in my life is my wife. 
Now, I will tell you, my wife and I uh, are completely different in a lot of ways. If you're new here, I'm going to say some things to kind of help you understand what some of those differences, some of the differences you're going to understand easily. I'm a man. She's a woman. I mean, hey, okay, we're different. We're opposite. Different plumbing. I get it. She's intellectual. I'm not so intellectual. She's academic. I'm not so academic. I mean, just so you know, I, I, I was like one of them in high school. My wife, number two in our class, graduated UCLA, gonna pre-med, going to be a pediatrician. This woman is like on top of it. I definitely married up. We spent some time uh, in, in one of our classes together was a geometry class, and I would walk into, this is how different we are, I'd walk into the class and she would be sitting with all of her friends, all the schooly school people, <laughs> marching band type. <laughs> that, that's not a negative. <laughs> See, right now, what we're seeing is you guys are proving the us and them in the room. Ho, oh, ho, ho, the marching band. All oh, the nerds. I wasn't one of them. <laughs> You're not cool enough to hang out with us. You're not smart enough to hang out with us. <laughs> I can play the clarinet. <laughs> I can't, I, I'm not going to tell you what I could do with your trombone. So almost every day, and I say almost every day because it's not a guarantee that every day I would go to class, but almost every day when I would go to class, and in those almost every days, there were certain days, probably a high percentage of those almost every days that I would show up to class, I would show up dressed like this. I'd have a pair of surf trunks on. That's it. Didn't have a shirt on. Wasn't really wearing shoes. I was just one of them, one of those guys. And I'd walk into math class and I'd have my sweatshirt under my arm and my shirt would be tucked somewhere in there. And I'd walk in and I'd acknowledge the teacher. His name is Mr. Stewart. He called himself Stewie and he was, he was quite old at the time. And good old Stewie didn't like good old Pat. And probably because I would walk in every day and acknowledge him, and then I would turn and walk up the very first aisle because it was the first aisle that you could get to walking in the door. And it was also the first aisle that I could get out the door as fast as possible. And so I'd turn up the aisle, I'd walk to the back of the aisle, I would lay that sweatshirt and whatever I had with me on the floor in a nice ball because it would resemble a pillow. I would lay on the floor and I would go to sleep. <laughs> True story. My wife and I are complete opposites. She thought I was funny. I, I, did not, that's not, I wasn't making a joke. I was tired. <laughs> Mr. Stewart, I was just one of them to Mr. Stewart because good old Stewie hated me so much. Okay, this is going to explain. See, I, I, I had a coach who uh, wanted me to be eligible to play a sport. So can you guess what's about to happen? So I'm failing the class. I have a 14 percentile in geometry, okay? How do you get a 14 percentile in geometry? That's a square. 14 percentile was my grade. So my coach goes to him and says, hey, we really need him to be eligible so that he can play <clears throat> this sport. So can you help us out? And good old Mr. Stewart said, I will be more than happy to help you out. I will pass him under one stipulation. My coach said, sure, whatever it is. He said, you guarantee me that Mr. Lynch never takes my class again. And so my coach came and told me, hey, bro, you can never take this class again. I'm like, I didn't want to take it the first time. <laughs> Isn't my grade painfully obvious that I don't want to be in the class? My wife are, and I are so completely different. Now, if you saw a family photo, which I don't have to show, you would also realize that my wife um, is black and I'm white. So you, she's dark chocolate. I'm white chocolate. She, she doesn't wear sunscreen. Uh, my children remind me on a daily basis that I'm built to wear sunscreen. The, the, 
This is, this is true. This is, this, hey, this is just a look into my life, okay? <laughs> but oftentimes what can happen is that we will embrace these moments with people that are opposite. But for some reason, and especially in society in 2018, if you're opposite of me, you become my opposition and you are now my opponent. And if you're my opponent, you and I are enemies. That if I'm a straight white male in America, okay, everyone, everyone, everyone grab their left hip right here. Okay, right here. Because I can feel the tension already. I just don't want you guys to get blown out of your chair. So just grab your left hip. I want you to pull the seatbelt out and click it right on the right side. Just hold on, okay? Here's the deal. Because I, because I am a white American male, that there are people that perceive me and conversely, because we're opposites. You see this all the time over Facebook. Like we make wild speculations about people. And what I'm here to tell you is, is God said, I love whosoever, all types. See, it's humanity that has the problem. God didn't look at me as his opposition and say, we're now, we are now enemies forever. In fact, he sent his son Jesus to be the bridge between the opposites. Jesus was the bridge to do away with the us and them mentality. It's sin that's entered into humanity. It's, it's actually our one and true, our one and only enemy, Satan, that wants you and I to live in a way that we see our opposites, we see our differences, and we somehow feel like we're completely opposed to one another, and whereas we're opponents, now we become enemies. So it's impossible for me to have a different opinion as an opposite of you without you thinking you hate me. Don't we see this happening? There's no us in them when it comes to God's love. We all belong. All of us. Now where it gets dicey is we take our intellect and we, we start doing some things that it actually in this very next scripture in 17 it says that God didn't do, Jesus doesn't do, but we do. And it's this word called condemn. Let me define this word condemn. It says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. So let's look at the, what this means. It means to examine a matter and come to a conclusion about it. That oftentimes with condemnation, we end up being the judge and the jury of people around us. And a lot of times we do it out of speculation. And this is what I mean. Uh, and just so you know, the word condemn gained popularity in the time that this scripture was written. It gained popularity and it had become a legal term that was used in literally passing judgment and sentencing in a court of law. And, and if you're sentenced in a court of law, then where do they send you? Huh? Send you to prison. So what God is, is saying in the scripture is, I didn't send Jesus to imprison you for something that I, I actually am trying to reconcile. What, what, what I'm saying is that oftentimes what we do is we see each other as opposites and we say, you don't belong because you actually are a prisoner of this thing. Uh, let, let, me, let me say this a different way. A lot of times we can look across the table at the wrongs or the differences of other people. And when we do that, we end up imprisoning people, we end up shackling people to the stake named their sin or named the thing that's different or named the thing that we think is wrong about them. We end up shackling them to that stake with that name on it instead of actually helping them walk in freedom. And we do that through a word called condemnation. And God didn't come to condemn me, and so why do I turn and want to condemn other people? Everyone just smile. We need, some, we need oxytocin. Touch the person next to you. If you're alone, lay your hands. You can just lay your hands and say, God, Jesus, help me. Like, we need some endorphins, okay? A 
Oftentimes what happens, and I'm going to speak to you personally, this is my own life. If you see yourself in me, then that's cool. But this is my crazy train. Oftentimes what happens is that guilt that I'm feeling about something in my own life, I'm quick to make other people feel guilty and bring condemnation to them. See, because if, I, if I'm a prisoner to my sin, if I'm a prisoner to things that I'm feeling guilty about, I want everyone else to be imprisoned. So that means I can still sit in our multicultural chairs right here because none of these chairs match. By the way, they don't match because we got a really good deal on them. <laughs> but I think it was kind of, I think it was kind of like foretelling about our church because if you also look around, none of your faces actually match either. Like we're all different socioeconomic, different ethnicities. I love it. There's something about the seats that kind of was, it was a foretelling of who it would be sitting in those seats. But our job is to not, when we sit in these seats, our job is to not then take the guilt that we feel about something and have something that we speculate about what's going on in other people's lives. Speculate about what they're thinking. Speculate about what they meant on their Facebook post. Speculate about what they meant when they didn't like my Instagram post. Speculate why they deleted that post after they said. Speculate why they didn't show up to my party. Why I sent the Evite, they didn't reply and they didn't show up. Because no one actually replies to the Evites, not in Southern California. They just show up to the wedding. They just don't tell you they're showing up to the wedding. You know what I'm talking about? So what happens is, is that I'm sitting and I'm feeling guilty about something and so I want other people to feel guilty. Misery loves company. I'm feeling condemned because of something I'm dealing with in my own life. And then what we do is we, we step out and we begin weighing sin and weighing wrongs. But maybe the thing that I'm sitting in the seat and I go to church every Sunday, I'm at church 48.5 times a year because I don't go every week because sometimes I have to stay home because my favorite football team is, is going to win and, and they're playing that team. Or maybe I've got something I'm doing with my kids and maybe I'm traveling or whatever. So 48.5 is a good round number. Is that a fair number? I just want to make sure we're on the same page because if we're not, there's a good chance we can't even be in the same room. Isn't this how it plays out? Like, it, it's, it's so crazy to me how polarizing our culture is to the point that I will guarantee you that some of your Facebook feeds, some of your Instagram feeds, some of your news feeds are not even giving you the information that someone sitting next to you is getting because of the algorithms that are built in. You're getting what they want you to get. Based on what you search for, based on what you like, based on what you read, you're, get, you're being given all of the news stories and all the pictures on your Facebooks and your Twitters and everything that resemble everything that looks like you. That what's being pushed down our throat is that we need to stay in this us and them mentality. And some of us like us and them mentalities because what it allows me to do is continue to blame other people for my own faults. It's their fault. You've had this argument before. I know I've had this with my wife. I'm like, honey, that was really offensive. She's like, you offended me last week. I'm like, well, you offended me five weeks ago. She's like, you've been, a, you've been offensive to me every morning. I had to wake up with your ugly face. I'm like, you offended me. Have any of you ever been in one of these arguments? Ha, ah, you are the only true couples in this room because the rest of you are lying. You're sitting on thrones of lies. And you smell like beef and cheese. Because this is the real conversation that we're having as couples. And like who, like how are we gonna work that out until we go back to like the original sin in the relationship? Well, it started the first time we went on a date. It's like, dude, let's take it all the way back to the, there's a story in the book of Genesis, it's the very first book in the Bible, and this, this guy named Adam and this woman named Eve, and there was this, this issue between the two of them, and the enemy came in and wanted to create this us and them mentality. Well, you see, it was, it was really, she offered it to me. God, what was I going to say? She was naked. I mean, she, she, she could have offered me glass on fire and I would have eaten it. <laughs> if 
<laughs> what happens is, is that wild speculation, we fill in the blanks, we, we assume what other people are thinking. I could stand and tell you, um, hey, I think our church, uh, it would be awesome if we had a response. How, how, how do we love? Like, this is extravagant love. This is outside. This is absurd. This is absurd to think about. Um, why don't we figure out someone, uh, let, let's, let's try to, like, brainstorm. There's lots of people, people listening. Let's try to figure out how we can love um, a caravan of people that are walking up toward our border of the United States. How could we love them? Boo, I'm beginning to polarize this room immediately. Because the reality is, is that some people will start filling in blanks and speculating. Based on a statement of love, you may speculate what my political agenda is, who I would vote for or I wouldn't vote for, what I believe in and what I may not believe in. You will start speculating and filling in blanks that you don't need to fill in because you don't know me. You're under the false assumption that you know me because you sit in a seat and maybe listen to me. It's no different than thinking you know the people that are traveling from a third world country like your best friend just because you read in the news outlet that has an algorithm to shove the information down your throat to, to come alongside of your opinion already. You think you know the people in this group that are standing at our border wanting a better chance of life. And we will assess the situation and pass judgment and come to a conclusion based on speculation. Because last I checked, I have not talked to anyone personally who's embedded themselves and talked to any of these people or have, have gone into the countries that they came from and have determined whether or not they're deserving of asylum or love or food. But we'll sit back and we'll let the agenda of other people inform us and we will speculate. This is where we're at. Are we talking now? This is where we're at culturally. We, we, we've hit the edge of the ultimate us and them. We have us and them in our home. We have, we, we have opponents that we condemn that are living with us. I joke about it, you know, my wife and I like, you know, well, you offended me. You offended me five weeks ago. Like we're living with some of these perceived opponents we're going to church with some of these perceived opponents. You know, like, gosh, I just, I don't really know. Like, the person who stands up and says amen and talks to the pastor, and like, the pastor, I think the pastor likes it. I'm not really sure. The pastor kind of likes, like, yeah, way to go, amen too. And then there's the worship person in church, and I don't really know if I agree with, like, he, it's like the person's holding a little turkey at Thanksgiving. What are they doing? And then the other person is like, check out, I'm wearing Axe body spray worship type guy. And like, smell my armpits. And like, I'm the loud worship person, or I'm the person who just sits quietly. And then the loud worship person is like, oh, these people are so grumpy. They just sit in the chair. The band is so amazing. You should be singing like you're at a Justin Bieber concert. And it's like, <laughs> what is happening? And it's just all these polarizing conversations. So we see it in our homes, we see it in our houses of faith, and we definitely see it in our communities. It's like, I don't go on that side of the tracks. And the funny thing is, is that all of us really are someone else's them. Oftentimes, if there's somebody that's opposite of me, someone who's opposition of me, there's probably, on both parts, there's there probably could be a lot gained by sitting down and having a dialogue, having some understanding. Let's just start one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, if we just, that would cut down on a lot of counseling and questions. This us versus them mentality has been bred into our humanity 
by the only true enemy that we have, Satan. And he likes to keep us as divided as he, as he did in the beginning when he divided Adam and Eve. And he separated us from God. And we have an opportunity to respond. We, the church, have an opportunity to respond. Based on what we're told, this is the set of rules that we're told by God to respond with. Can, can, can I tell you, this is just a very, uh, whatever, I'm going to say it. The government is in place to govern and give laws. The church is in place to read this and do what it says. And one of the number one commands we have is to love. The government is in place to govern and give us laws. The church is in place to read this book and love people well. Pat, you know, people are breaking the law. They're, 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 you just can't do this. And I'm not talking about the legalities. I was a criminal to Christ. And he loved me. Judas was a criminal to Christ. And he loved him. In fact, when he saw him in the garden, he knew Judas was going to betray him. The story goes something like this. He actually walks up to Jesus. And he, he gives him a kiss. And Jesus calls him his friend. Jesus didn't start looking at all the rules that he had broken and what laws. Did you know the money that Judas was paid with was taken out of the tithe? One of Judas's jobs is he actually oversaw the money. And he was paid from the fairs. He was paid with the money from the church. The money that Jesus was betrayed with came from the very thing that he died for. I don't want to debate about the governance. I want to know real solutions to real problems. That is what the world is, not figuratively, not metaphorically, the world is dying to see waiting all of creation holding its breath for us to step in and to make an assessment and say I know that I'm not deserving but God loved me and because he did I'm not going to make the determination that you're not deserving I think one of the things that we do oftentimes is we celebrate the failure of our enemies. The reason I'm bringing this up is in Proverbs 24, 17, it says, don't gloat when your enemy falls, when they stumble. Do not let your heart rejoice. The Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from them. The idea is, is that oftentimes I think I can, I can in my head say, well, I don't have hate in my heart toward people. There's no them in my life. I've had people tell me today, you know, Pat, <laughs> high five, awesome message. You know, I just don't have any them in my life. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm perfectly clean of that. I'm like, oh no, you do. We all, we all actually have some of this buried in our hearts. Just, just so you know. There's no us and them when it comes to this topic. We're all actually dealing with this. And so what happens is, is that when our enemy fails and falls, when we celebrate, <laughs> huh, today is a day to celebrate. The political agenda of our opposition has failed.
there's this low key subversive passive aggressive hate when we celebrate when our enemy fails that's the truth I've, I've had conversations with people that say, Pat, I just don't feel like that, that kind of hate exists. And I, I, I have conversations, maybe because my wife and I are interracial, uh, that have to do with race and ethnicity. And I just don't feel like we're in that place anymore in America. Huh. Well, maybe not overtly, but if we're still celebrating the failure of our opposition, there is still hate alive. One time, uh, a leader, great leader, you know, person loved the Lord. We were having a conversation, and uh, there was a, the previous president to our current president. His name was Barack Obama. Just in case you lived under a rock and didn't know that. And our current president, his name is Donald Trump, if you were still living under that same rock. But I, I, I just, I want, I'm saying that because I, I want us to be really clear. So when Barack Obama was president, um, there was something going on surrounding his, his presidency. And it was, it was kind of tough on, on, our, on our country. Some people weren't very happy about it, and it was there was some us and them going on. And my wife and I were standing there, and uh, this leader turns to my wife and says, "Well, it's not my fault. He's your president." The assumption, the speculation that because my wife is African American and so Barack Obama is, that somehow it was her blame to take because. It was their problem. Part of them. That in the heart was the celebration that there was some failure going on in the presidency and it validated somehow this person's position. And it demeaned my wife. My wife had the most amazing response. She smiled and she went hmm and she took it as I know now where you stand I've been able to determine where you stand but that does not change whether or not you deserve love because I'm like we should fight Really, right now. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you see how, how this makes its way to the surface and how the distortion that the enemy wants us to have of each other becomes divisive and polarizing as these two groups form us? Matthew 5, I'm going to finish with this. Matthew 5, 43 through 47. Now I'm going to read this out of the message. The message is, is a translation of the Bible that for this series has been really helpful because I think it's giving weight to some words that we don't use some of the words that we find in Scripture, in community, and in our normal vernacular, and our language. And so sometimes I think some of the weight of what we read in Scripture gets lost. But when I read the message version, it puts it in language that we would use kind of on a daily basis, and it gives some of, some of that weight back so that we're not just intellectually hearing the words and we go, we understand what that means, but we're feeling what that means. Is that making sense? Matthew 5, 43, 47 says, you're familiar with the old written law, love your friend and its unwritten uh, companion, hate your enemy, because this is really where we're at. Love your friends, hate your enemies. 
Like get close to your friends. Uh, get, 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 get with your tribe. These are, these are the cultural trigger words, right? You can find your tribe. The more you keep finding your tribe and you keep moving away from other tribes of people, the more isolated you will become. And by the way, that isolation, this is the new statistic I heard two days ago. The United States of America for the third year in a row has declined in its life expectancy of, of uh, adults. We're the only first world country that's declining. Do you know that? Do you, do you know why science has said that our life expectancy in America has gone down three years in a row? Because of the complete isolation, the polarization of our culture and the despair that it causes and hopelessness of feeling that isolation, that us and them so deeply in us, that people are turning to suicide, addiction. That's why we're seeing opioid addiction go through the roof. Love your friend and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. If I want my life expectancy to go up, I need to listen to this scripture. Because I'm telling you that when we disobey this, when we disobey this dialogue, when we don't just take it head on and we don't choose to do something about it, it's literally killing you and I and making our lives shorter. Proven. We're not dying because we don't have food. We're not dying because we don't have clean water. We're not dying because we don't have shelter. We're not dying for any of those reasons. I'm here to tell you that we're not even dying because of the political agendas. We're dying because you and I have lost the ability to sit down, look at each other in the eye and have a dialogue that says, I'm willing to take all of your opposites, all of the things that God has built into you and accept them and love you as you are. That's what you need to hear. That's what you need to hear. This is what's happening. This isn't some like, oh, great talk, pastor, doesn't really mean anything. It's killing us. All the stuff we're hearing about on Fox News and CNN, not killing us. It's not. This is killing us. That America is still the most segregated on Sunday mornings. That's killing us. That neighborhoods are still divided. That's killing us. That we don't have the ability to sit down and have a dialogue with someone that looks different from us, who is so wildly opposite and not see them as our opponent and as our enemy, that's killing us. We're being fed this stuff. We're being fed to keep us in this place. The enemy wants us to stay divided. He wants your relationships. He wants your marriages. He wants your relationship with your parents. He wants your relationship with your coworkers. He wants your, I mean, he wants you irritated. The enemy wants you irritated to the point that as soon as someone looks different than you, you're ready to give him the finger and call him your enemy. And Jesus says, I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let me bring, let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. Ha! You mean like yesterday when I tried to go to Costco two times? I don't know what happened. I like showed up to Costco and I was like, I just want a parking space. And then I left because I couldn't. I was like, okay, I'm going to leave and try this again. So I went and got my 13-year-old daughter and I went back to Costco. And went back and I said, this is so infuriating that you're all my enemy. You sh Do you know how to park a car, man? Like you should pull your head out of that parking space. And like, you can't fit five cars like that in the aisle way. And like, what's going on? And, and to the elderly man who I didn't let, I didn't let my perceived enemy bring out the best in me. And I, I, I didn't like stick my hand out the window and give him like, you know, this or the number one sign. But like, hey, you, you know, when you like the person in front of you looks in the rear view mirror and they catch your eye, you know, I waited for him and he caught my eye and I saw him and I went. What are you doing? <laughs> park your car, man. You know one of those? Park your car, man. Like here, I'm going to get out and park it for you. 
Loving my enemy, did it bring out my best? I'm just digging, this is just me. I know that all of you probably are saints in the Costco parking lot. <laughs> Forget about when you try to go to the Walmarts and the Targets and the food for less, because it's about to get crazy. All of your salvation is, you laugh at me now. Your salvation is on the line in the next three weeks. You might miss Jesus entirely if you show up. I'm just saying that's the, that, that's the kind of pressure I'm under right now because the parking lot got so crazy. But the truth is I probably should have got out of the car and gone up to the gentleman and said, hey, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do something real quick. I'm gonna stand and hold traffic for you so that you can pull your car in. Because what I wanted to do was go like turn, like just accelerate, accelerate. <laughs> Right there, gas pedal, like just this foot right here. I was so irritated. But like, I'm thinking about it and I'm like, did it bring out my best? I should have, I should have just put my car in park and got out and helped him and said, hey guys, could you just hold on a second? I understand you're trying to get in line with the 7,000 other people at the Costco gas station, but it's okay. They'll be there in 10 hours, so will you. but it didn't bring out the best in me. I know that you guys can make it better. I blew it. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with energies of prayer. Nope, didn't do that. Yeah, I prayed, God, please make the people here smarter. Raise the average IQ from down here in the basement up to here. So when they pull into this parking lot, they don't lose intelligence. For then you were working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives his best. The sun to warm and the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless. The good, the bad, the nice, and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. <laughs> do you know the easiest people to love are the people just like you? I'm so good at loving people. Really? I want to see your circle of influence. I wanna see if anyone doesn't look like you. When we say, hey, good morning, movement family, stand up, say hi to somebody that you don't know or someone that, that that's not just some funny thing that I'm saying, it's because I actually believe it in my heart, this is what God wants. He wants us to step outside of our comfort zone and reach across the aisle someone who doesn't look anything like me, probably comes from a completely different background. Maybe they don't even speak the same language as me. They don't live in the same neighborhood as me. I go, hi, how are you doing? My name is Pat. Nice to meet you this morning. There's so much in that that can, that, that can start to change things. That's how I met my wife. I was like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> if you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? How many times do we walk through the stores and through culture and society and our communities and we just keep our head down and we don't say hi to people that look anything like us and we just go on assuming that those people, that they're the they's and the them's and that they're just not nice and they're just kind of grumpy and they don't say anything and there's this weird, but our job is to actually draw near first. God drew near first. This scripture is saying, Hey, it's easy to say hi to people who say hello to you. You know, when you're walking down the street and you're trying, you're like on your phone because you're like, good God, no one say hi to me. I'm like this sometimes. I'm like, can I just go into the store and have no one know who I am? One time my wife booked a massage for me. I show up and she tells the lady, my husband's really shy. She goes, oh, okay. I show up and the woman opens the door to the massage place and she goes, oh my God, it's you. <laughs> You're the pastor of the movement. Sorry, I got the wrong door. I'm painfully shy. God's, 
The reason I'm making fun of this is God's working on this with me. It's easy when someone goes, hey, how's it going for you to pick your head up and go, how you doing? And go right back to your phone. Because by the way, that's where most of us are spending our time. But how often do we walk through with our heads up in, in culture and we find the person, we go, how's it going? I do this actually, it's really funny now. I pick the person who looks nothing like me. Sweetest lady's checking me out at Sprouts. She was, she was real sweet. Hi, how you doing today? She's like, good. I, th- I could tell she was kind of like, oh, chipper white guy. I bet she went home and told her friends about it. I had this real chipper white guy come through. Hey, how you doing today? Can we laugh a little bit? Come on. There's no offense in love. Love doesn't distinguish who needs it. Love doesn't discriminate. We do all that for love. Love doesn't have the ability to determine whether or not you or they or them or us deserve it. We do that. And we get it wrong. Love is always ready to win. Love, in fact, is determined to always win if we don't try and determine who gets to win our love. That's the problem. Why don't you stand with me this morning? I'm going to end with this passage really quickly. 1 Corinthians 13, 3 says, I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love. I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best. Are you looking for the best in those people? Are you looking for the best in that group that's saying we're fighting for equality? Are you, are you actually looking for the best and assuming the best in that group of people that are traveling up from a third world country? Are we assuming the best of the people that are, that are talking about these things politically? Are we assuming the best when it comes to our neighbor? Are we assuming the best when it comes to our spouse or our children or our coworkers or our friends? Are we always assuming the best or are we always looking and saying, I'm going to assume the very worst When you make that post, when you say that thing, when you look at me that way, there's these things behind it. And I'm gonna speculate and come to a conclusion. And then I'm gonna keep track of all the things that you've done wrong. It never looks back, but keeps going to the end. And verse eight says, love never fails. I know that I do, but if love doesn't, let's get on with love. Let's let's be individuals in a family that draws near first. We're willing to draw near first, to see the opposites, draw near to an opposite. My challenge to you today is draw near to those who are opposite and become the bridge, just like Jesus did. Are you willing to? Are you willing to individually, personally, find someone that literally looks nothing like you, sit down, have a dialogue, have a conversation? If you already do that, help other people do that. Encourage the conversations. Let's pray. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that we would be able to walk out of here with strength and courage to do something that seems very simple on the surface and that's love. The church, we, we need to really learn to love well. 
but that is a difficult thing to do. And so I'm not, just not some passive thing where I'm like, what's the answer to it? Love's the answer. Yes, love is the answer. But there are practical things to that. We are the hands and the feet. You are the hands and the feet to that answer. God, I pray against the polarization that we see happening, that we would be bridges to draw near to people to be willing to have the conversation with opposites, to be willing to not look at people as opponents just because they may uh, be different than us. We wouldn't draw speculative conclusions on what people are thinking and where they stand, on who they love and how they love. Lord, that we would be people that would run headfirst into the middle and be willing to love. In Jesus' powerful name, everyone said, amen.